Uh, so my name is Professor Charles Spence. I'm an experimental psychologist. I work at Oxford University and I run the Crossmodal Research Laboratory uh, where I've been for the last 17 years or so. A lab that brings together psychologists, food scientists, chefs, composers, fashion designers, marketeers, uh, all brought together to, to look at the, how the senses interact and to try and apply the latest insights from brain science to the real world. So how could you, how could you name your field of research? What's the word? Uh, Cross-modal research laboratory is a name for the lab. Um, so research laboratory, I guess you get. Uh, the cross-modal bit is um, kind of cross between and a modal or the senses. So it's got between the senses and how uh, one sense can affect another sense. So how if I add a certain fragrance, it may make people look more attractive. If I change the sound of the crunch, it may change the feel of the crisp. These are all examples of cross-sensory or cross-modal research. But what is it called in psychology, your, your senses? What, 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 how do you call this field? Um, uh, various names for the sort of, the sort of area, but it could be sort of multi-sensory perception, multi-sensory integration, multi-sensory research uh, is kind of the common term. So what's, what's your thing, what senses? What's my thing? Um, I guess since I was an undergraduate here back in 1980-something, um, I had to do a project for my undergraduate degree and I uh, didn't really have any idea. I had other things that interested me at the time, but uh, somebody put me onto this guy who had a broken TV. And for my first project, my first experiments were about sort of a breaking televisions and moving the sounds. So they didn't come from the TV, they came from somewhere else. And just seeing how that impacted people's ability to perceive what, what was being said and where they thought things were happening. I don't understand that. A, t a TV broke down? Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine a little apartment uh, or flat bed sit uh, in the south side of Oxford. And you have um, a TV and some people come around to watch a movie. And the credits start rolling. And you hear the sort of thematic music. Um, everything seems fine. And then once the credits are finished and the first actor starts to speak, suddenly there's a disconnect because you see their lips moving on the screen. But their voices are coming from the loudspeaker over there. And your brain says, what's going on? My senses aren't coordinated. There's like a, a moment of sort of uh, stopping and trying to figure out what is going on. Uh, but then a few moments later, suddenly your brain puts it all back together again and you start to hear the voices as if they're coming from the lips on the screen. That would be kind of the ventriloquist dummy illusion. Um, and my kind of research was, was looking at that sort of situation, how it is that your brain detects a discrepancy between where it sees things and hears things and then how it puts it all back together again. And that is the multi-sensory perception, the multi-sensory integration as I take a voice that I hear over here, but which I think belongs with the voice, the lips I see on the screen over there and your brain kind of glues them back together. Um, and that is kind of the topic of my study. And over the years, I started on hearing and vision back in the late eighties. And then over the years, I brought in the sense of touch and then when we've done everything we can think about doing in the sense of touch, then comes smell, then comes taste and pain uh, and so on. So kind of adding senses to the, to the portfolio as the years go by. So uh, the, what is the portfolio right now? What are our senses? All of them. Um, hard to say. It depends who you ask. If you uh, ask the people in the lab, as well, I... You're a professor. So... <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, professor just, the professor just asks questions. They don't, they don't yeah, have the answers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, at least five. And you, I could find, I could, I could reference you people who'd say as many as forty-three. So that's kind of a, a, a deep problem of definition of what is a sense. Uh, but certainly, hearing, vision, touch, taste, and smell, everyone agrees on. Oh, we're going too fast. Touch, taste, smell, hearing, and vision, kind of the five basic senses that I think everyone agrees are five senses. Beyond that, you might think about the sense of uh, a, 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 of a kinesthesis, your your body in space and how it's moving. Uh, you might think about kind of a pheromonal sense, kind of the sort of chemical communication between uh, creatures of the same species. We know it exists in animals, maybe it exists in humans, maybe not. Um, and from there you'll find others who will talk about uh, pain. Is that a separate sense or is it part of touch? Uh, some you might, who might even claim as a hint of a magnetic sense or a, or a sixth sense, a feeling of you know, someone's looking at me or I know what's going on, um, and, and the list goes on. Do Some might want to say... Do you think there's a sixth sense? I think there's something that... Uh, uh, not in the way it's used in, in marketing and uh, 
So I mean, I, I've worked with car companies that have, have sold their cars as having the sixth sense. Mm. Uh, but, what, but what people normally mean by that is just kind of an increased awareness, almost like a spooky awareness of, of things you don't know quite how you know that you know that someone is looking at you, say. Um, so I think we are can be pick up things and be aware of things without realising how we know. And that sometimes the information comes in not through the sense we imagine, because we imagine we kind of see most of the stuff we know about, whereas in fact maybe it's the, it's the subtle smells that can tell you whether somebody else has uh, just come back from the pub or has been watching a scary movie, whether they're ovulating or something else. These are kind of subtle cues um, that sometimes get dominated by the higher senses of vision and yet can nevertheless feed into our judgments and sometimes give us that feeling of, of, of knowing. So, uh, but you say there are five senses, well... Uh, At least five senses. Uh, everybody says there are five, yeah. but maybe there are more. Uh, and um, what, what, what do you think is the most important one? Is there an important, most important one? Uh, so I think uh, there definitely is this kind of a sensory hierarchy, that some senses are more important than others. Um, most of the research, most of the writing, uh, most of our introspection sort of tells us that vision is the dominant sense, the most important one. And certainly when you look inside uh, the brain, you'll find more of the cortical real estate is given over to processing what we see than to any or all of the other senses. So the numbers from the neuroscientists would be something like 50 to 55, more than half of your brain is involved in processing visual inputs from your eyes. Uh, just 10 to 15 percent of your brain is involved in hearing or in touch and when it comes to smell or taste you're down to one or two percent so in terms of how much of our brain is given over to each sense it's clear that vision dominates and yet as a uh, most of our research for the last 20 years has been trying to demonstrate how important the other senses are too and that depending on the so sorts of questions you ask or the situations you're in in fact what we smell what we hear, what we feel, and even what we taste can be far more important than we realise. It doesn't make them the, the dominant sense, but it means there's more information there, there's more value to be had through stimulating the other senses, uh, even though we don't think about them very often, we don't talk about them so much. Uh, and so they are overshadowed by the, by the, by the visual. By vision. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, thank you. Also vision. Yes, it's about <laughs> shadows. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, the the fact that you think uh, well, vision is dominant, uh, and we we we, it's possible to to use more of our other uh, senses, but is it just a um, conviction or is it is it um, uh, is it a fact? Uh, both. <laughs> so. Um, why, why 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 bother? Why bother? Um, why not just stay with the visual? Well, a kind of number of answers to why engaging the other senses is interesting and ultimately important. Uh, from a research trajectory, sort of personally, then uh, I think there's a lot of open space to be tackled. There are many, many very clever people who just study vision, who just study hearing, but there haven't been so many who look at how the senses connect. And being that kind of jack of all trades, knowing a little bit about each of the senses uh, opens up a huge kind of a area of research space um, and that has really exploded over the last quarter of a century so it's important in that way uh, but more generally which is coming up which which other sense is coming up um, so I think uh, if you go back to I mean, when I arrived in Oxford in the 80s there were there was a scientist who just studied vision and next to him was a scientist who just studied hearing and they hadn't spoken to each other for you know decades literally because they had some falling out and neither thought that they lost anything by not speaking to the other. They thought, I can just focus on vision for my whole life. That's all I need to know about. And what that guy over there does is irrelevant to me. It's a different sense. Um, so I think what's, what, what's coming up, we've seen since sort of the 70s, as people have started to get interested in how the senses interact, uh, it's normally hearing and vision that's the easiest to study, the most commonly studied. These are the higher, the rational senses. Then as the years go by, people start to bring in touch. Uh, as a spatial sense, tells us where things are. Um, and only then do you find, and over the, only over the last, in this century, do you find people looking at smell and then taste. Uh, why? Because they're maybe sort of harder to study. Your subjects adapt, they get full up, it's messy. I can't just put you in front of a computer and away you go, mixing smells and tastes and flavours and foods. That's much more challenging and requires a broader 
skill set, and for that reason, it has been sort of neglected until, until very recently. But I see I'm kind of on a mission to try and convince my colleagues that um, the lower senses, so called, the smell and the taste and the touch, are much more important, are very exciting, do have a profound impact on our lives. Um, my colleagues have may I maybe just smile at me at the moment and say, nah, nah, we'll just study hearing and vision. But I'm, I, I'm optimistic that as the years go by, more and more researchers will start to engage with the other senses and that will be the, uh, the frontier that we're sort of at at the moment. And I see some of them starting to, to do research on taste in a way that they'd never have done before. Um, and I see the huge kind of public interest in, uh, I mean, everyone likes to eat and drink. Yeah, of course, but, but you say it's a frontier. That's right. Uh, um, and I wonder, what does it say about the time to living that we are looking for more of the lower senses? Is it, is it because of the times we're living in? Or <laughs> so, um, I think if, if you go back, yeah, or? in a way, so I think there's a few, few trends kind of, kind of coalescing at the same time. Uh, on the one hand, you, you sort of find, uh, if you go back to about 2000 or so, you'll find people saying, you know, sort of sensory overload, there's just too much information, too many screens, too many mobile devices beeping and, and flashing, uh, too many videos, it's all just too much information, I can't really cope, it's kind of stressful just being anywhere. Uh, but when you break that down, what you find is it's mostly just sm uh, sorry, hearing and vision. It's too much technology allows you to present more and more audio-visual stuff, but it doesn't do anything for your sense of touch. It doesn't do anything for your sense of smell or, or, or taste. Um, and it's that kind of realisation that's kind of a sensory imbalance almost, that we're overloading these higher rational senses at the neglect, at the cost of our more emotional senses. And there are some benefits, you know, each sense probably is, is good at delivering certain kinds of benefits or rewards or, or things. Um, and it can be much easier to deliver those through through touch and, and smell. And maybe you see sort of society at large moving towards sort of aromatherapy, massage, spa treatments has been a big growth area. And maybe that's partly about bringing back the touch and the smell uh, in, in a way that was being missed or, or lost from society at large. I think it's also partly about uh, the growth of the star chef. And uh, everyone loves... Most people love to watch cookery shows. They're, you can't turn the television on without seeing some cookery show or other. That's been a huge explosion of interest. Um, and those chefs have, over the last decade, a number of them, been engaging more with the senses. I mean, they always engage with the senses, uh, but they're on TV and they're thinking more how to not just engage the senses on the plate or in the glass, but in the environments in which they serve their diners um, and trying to figure out the sort of science behind it. They do it intuitively, they do it artistically, but what's the science here to help support the sorts of design decisions they're making. And then you have the rise of the kind of the millennials who are from what all the marketeers will tell us. They don't want products and things, they want experiences, experiences that they can share. And those experiences can be delivered through smell and taste uh, uh, and other kinds of sensory, sensorium, sensory experiences, multi-sensory events. Okay, that's very clear because uh, now I understand that I, product of my time, and that I, that I get influenced or, or touched or uh, anything inspired, maybe, uh, by... So, if you can give it a name, uh, the period we, we, we're in or we come from, and the per period we're going to, like changing or, uh, or balancing the senses as we, uh, as we experience it. Is it, is it, are we approaching new times in that sense? Uh, I certainly hope so, that uh, the kind of research we do and the people we talk to will uh, hopefully convince some of them uh, to think more carefully about how their own sensory worlds and how their senses are engaged on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think we're sort of seeing a, a bit of a shift also, in a way, from when we've had sort of decades of what's called the experience economy, Companies, brands, you know, from Starbucks to, to Lego to Disney, uh, they're not selling you products anymore, they're selling you experiences. And that's been a hugely powerful driver uh, in marketing. And, and you can't open a magazine or go into many shopping centers without somebody telling you, I'm going to give you the experience. Um, that experience is of, kind of necessity, multi sensory, 
but for, but for these last few decades, it's felt like it's sort of companies who are, who are, who are delivering the experience, who are delivering the senses, to almost manipulate you to make you buy more. And what I think is changing now, and what I see a lot happening in, in the UK, especially in London, is kind of the rise of, a, of what some are calling kind of sense exploration, by which you mean it's kind of, uh, it's almost like the public, uh, you and I taking control back, sort of curious about our senses, and wanting to experience more, experience differently. I'm, uh, and this explains the rise of everything from your know, classical music concerts uh, that are you listen to while tasting matching wines, perfume concerts, chocolate with 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 with, with uh, contemporary jazz, um, or or the Tate Museum in London last year had the Tate Sensorium, four paintings from the collection that are uh, two or three thousand people got to to view while at the same time feeling some virtual touch, smelling some perfume, and maybe even eating a chocolate. It's connecting the senses in a new way. Um, and it sort of feels that it's kind of the artists, often culinary artists, uh, experienced designers, chefs who are, who are exploring this space and almost giving us the chance to, to make new connections between our senses. Um, and it's that, you know, exploration rather than exploitation, I guess, that's, that, that's kind of a, a shift, I think. And, and it's a shift that's also built on going from kind of obvious sensory interactions by which I mean things like uh, you go to the, the rainforest cafe in London and it's meant to be like a rainforest so you've got kind of greenery and then you've got a thunderstorm and some rain and maybe a smell of, uh, of the green uh, notes or it's kind of obvious in a way yeah I get it yeah. or you know it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of top restaurants are trying to do picnics now and the picnics they'll give you the smell the sounds of the picnic of nature with a basket yeah it sort of works it's engaging all the senses but it's kind of obvious um, and what's more interesting is the more kind of synesthetic kind of connections, the ones that aren't so obvious. Um, so, for example, that most of us will connect sweetness with roundness, with pinky red colour, with sweetness, high pitch. Sweet, sweetness with so a sweet taste round, with round. round. And most people will say bitter tasting foods, dark chocolate, coffee, beer is angular. That's kind of a surprising, almost synesthetic connection between our senses. I didn't realise, but now you mention it yet. And you can ask your friends and they'll all say the same. And there are all lots of these surprising, almost synesthetic connections between tastes and smells, colours, sounds, shapes, textures, feelings. Uh, and as we pick up on those new connections, and we're in this environment where consumers want to explore their senses, and we have the artists and the chefs who want to play and deliver new stuff to their consumers. I think it's a really sort of rich uh, uh, nexus for, for this whole new way of engaging. And because it is this almost synesthetic connection, that's why I almost need to sort of try it for myself to see, is, is my, does my brain work like that too? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it just yours? Uh, and what other strange connections might be there? And where does it uh, end? Where, where does the fun end and, and, the, and the, the, the science starts? What's the... So it's all the same. Yeah? <laughs> where, where does it go serious? It is. Everything I've said is serious. Yeah, I, I it's know. It's fun. I know, I know it's serious, <laughs> but I mean, for the perception of people and for, for people to, uh, to, uh, um, to join th this idea, uh, so far you can, you can just test people and there's nothing... There's no difference, or there, there's no. Uh, uh, um, you can research and uh, uh, and make your own theories about it, mm -hmm. but um, uh, um, at which moment does it really influence the way we live and and how we are in a serious way? Because um, so so far, if I think sweetness is round, yep. oh, okay, okay, so, so what? So what? So then, um, uh, what you might do if you are a chocolate manufacturer, for example, and you're being told by government or out of the, the goodness of your own heart, you think you want to reduce some of the unhealthy ingredients in the foods that you present to the market. Uh, if I could tell you that by making your chocolates rounder, they will taste sweeter to people. So you can reduce the sugar content, but keep the perception the same. That's something people might want to know about and certainly do. If I can tell you from any other food or drink product that uh, by changing the shape of your product, the, the, the logo or the label design, uh, you can set expectations in the mind of those you're serving that can enhance their taste perception uh, through that brand loyalty that can maybe you know, help you to, to, to just to reduce these unhealthy ingredients by these tricks of the mind 
That is something that you know pretty much every large food and beverage company is interested in. Because they know that if they actually reduce sugar, if they actually reduce salt or fat, consumers will say, stop, stop it, you're, you're spoiling my favourite brand, put it back the way it was. No, we're all being told by government we have to do this, uh, and we think it's a good thing for society at large, maybe. So these kind of tricks of the mind, by changing the colour, by changing the shape, by eating while listening to a certain sort of music that can bring out sweetness, potentially at least, offers a way of keeping everyone happy, making your foods healthier, without changing the taste for the consumer. Um, but of course, in the first instance, the companies will go, Puff, ridiculous, what do you mean? I make my chocolate round, it's going to taste sweeter. Yeah, off you go. Come on. Yeah. yeah, so people don't believe it, it's surprising. Um, but you, but, but so we just, through. Yeah, so we do experiment upon experiment upon experiment, uh, publish them in scientific journals, but no one ever reads those, um, which is where then the interface with the chefs or, 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 or experienced designers comes in. If we can do large events where we have thousands of people coming through and they get to experience for themselves that when I play this music, what you're tasting tastes sweeter. When I play that music, suddenly it tastes more bitter. Um, then that's, that's a way of kind of convincing people. And from there, from these fun, enjoyable, engaging, multi-sensory events, sense exploration, from there, that's the kind of starting point um, to, to take the science that we do, which can be boring and dry, uh, put it in the hands of a creative chef or mixologist or experienced designer to turn the science into something fun, exciting, enjoyable, uh, and tasty, uh, then expose people to it. And through that is the proof of principle that then the big brands, the airlines, the hospital trusts come, they experience it, and they'd never have dared do it by themselves, but they experience it in the restaurant or in these events, and then they go away and innovate. And as a case in point, uh, just take British Airways, the airline. Uh, they're on its long haul flights from 18 months ago. Uh, that we were doing tastings with music for some of them. They came along, they got it, and then they went back and changed the music in their long-haul flights so that when you order a meal in the aeroplane, you can just plug into the headset in, in the side of your seat and there's one music channel specially designed to enhance the taste of the food that they're serving. So by music it tastes better? Yeah. For everybody who, who, who listens to it. <laughs> or is but it uh, also, because it's a bit of mind-boggling that, that, that uh, if you can change every, every uh, perception or yep. every experience of, of one of your senses, um, then what what what, hap what happens to your uh, uh, um, your feeling of truth? Because I know I like chocolate, but you say, well, I can I can change your idea of chocolate uh, the way, uh, and it, 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 my senses feel like they're mine. Mm -hmm. So we all, so I mean, I guess it's true that we all, psychologists, food critic, uh, wine expert, uh, regular consumer alike, believe we can, for example, just taste the, the drink in the glass or the food on the plate. None of us believe that the chair you're sitting on, that the lighting, that the music has an impact. No, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like I'm tasting what's in the glass and you can't convince me otherwise. And there are many chefs, many people we talk to who are of that opinion. Uh, and intuitively, I sort of share it myself. And yet I know when we do the research, and we measure how, and I give you a piece of chocolate and I say, how sweet was it from one, which is very bitter, to 10, which is the sweetest chocolate you've ever had? I know that, I can't guarantee that every single person, but that eight out of 10, say, or 800 out of 1,000, will agree that this chocolate will give it a sweeter, they'll say it tastes sweeter to them when the sweet music's playing. But most of those people will deny that the music is having any impact, they'll all say that, but when I tally up the scores, of those who had sweet music, those who had bitter music, I'll yeah. see there's a difference, um, and that is the proof. And I think, in a way, uh, it's, I can't, you can't turn water into wine. There are limits. So these are mostly kind of nudges. If I give you a food that's, say, bittersweet, like a dark chocolate or a, a black coffee with a bit of sugar, I can make it 10% sweeter or 10% more bitter, but I can't give you a glass of water, and somehow by changing the music, by changing the lighting, make you think you're tasting wine or anything else. So there are limits, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's a sort of truth of your senses, but it's always flexible, yeah, but it's always it's, modifiable. But it's never fooling. Never? Fooling. You're, not, you're never fooling someone. Ah. Because it's its own experience. <sighs> um, so it depends, if, if, well, if, if you take the example, kind of the classic example of you get the wine expert and you get them a glass of white wine and you add some colorless 
odorless red dye, so it looks like a red wine. If you can convince that expert, and many experts have been convinced that what they smell are all the red wine aromas, the chocolate and the tobacco and the stone fruits, that feels like fooling. Because without that red colour, they, they smell citrus and straw and honey and, and buttery notes. Add the red colour and suddenly it smells completely different to the expert. You could call that fooling, you could call that uh, trickery. And that maybe there is no uh, absolute truth of our senses because we always eat and drink, experience things in some environment and that environment, whatever it is, wherever we are, be it clothing to food, to cocktails, to coffee, uh, to a car sales room, we're always getting sensory inputs and they're all probably having some impact on us. We'll all deny it and it's our job kind of as a, as a psychologist not to believe you when you tell me this is what inf is influencing your behaviour, why you like something more than another, but instead uh, to measure, kind of observe your behaviour and your performance and demonstrate that sometimes you know, the way it feels to us is not the way it actually is. And also just to pick those examples from everyday life, I think um, you're a Northern European as well, so you'd understand kind of the Provencal Rosé paradox. I think everyone has had the experience that they go on holiday to the sunshine, to the Mediterranean, and that glass of rosé or wine tastes beautiful, the cheese is marvellous, the, the, the sausages are fabulous, so good in fact, and so cheap you want to buy some and bring them back home. And you bring some of that wine back home and then on a cold winter's night you open it with your friends to sort of sh recount the tales and it, it tastes different. It doesn't taste like the same wine. And everyone has had a version of that experience. In Taiwan they, they come to England and the tea tastes amazing, they take it back, it doesn't taste different. In South America where my wife is from, it's a Cartagena on the Colombian coast, things taste different there than they do in the capital Bogota. Everyone has had that experience. And what is it? It's not that the wine has changed. All that has changed is the mood that you're in and the atmosphere in which you eat and drink. That's clear. Uh, and um, <clears throat> can you say that, uh, that, uh, that the way we perceive things uh, and, and, and is it like an evolution evolutionary kind of thing that we are programmed like this that, that, that's, a, that's a matter yep. of survival yep. Yep. so um, there's kind of a question well why do we need so many senses wouldn't just one do why do we have to have five or six or seven or th 43 because you know the more senses we've got the more trouble your brain has trying to combine what it hears with what it sees and with what it tastes so the fewer the senses the simpler the kind of computational uh, a problem to be solved you might think so there is a cost to adding more senses, um, and, and why do we have so many, and why do we have the ones that we do? Well, maybe it's something about, you know, uh, ice ages and dark ages, meaning the vision wasn't so good, so other senses came out and developed, and then, and then the lights came back on, as it were, and suddenly you've got two senses. And, but in fact, I think the, the real answer is that each and every one of our senses is noisy, because we are a biological sensing system, so there's always noise, noise in the machine. Uh or like a computer, you know, um, uh, and that noise in the system means that sometimes there are kind of false alarms. I think I saw something, but did, did, no. I thought I heard my name, but no. So all the time there are these kind of false alarms. Each of our senses is just a bit noisy and, and sending these false alarms. And if we only had one sense to go on, we'd be perpetually distracted by these false alarms that weren't actually something happening. However, if um, I think I hear something, I think I saw something, it's very unlikely that two of my senses accidentally fired at the same time. And if I thought I saw and heard something and they were both from the right, that's even more unlikely. So by having different senses that each we assume have their separate noise variation, then by kind of pooling two senses, I get a much better index of what's happening in the world and can ignore, cut out more of the noise of my sensory apparatus. It's like uh, collecting evidence. Yep. Uh, and then the more senses you have, the better in that sense. So that's part of the advantage, evolutionarily speaking. And then also probably it's the case that each of our senses is good at something, and each of our senses is good at something different. So I want to know what something is, or where it is. My eyes are as good as any sense. But if I want to know when did something happen, how quickly did it change, my ears are much better, because they're a mechanical rather than a chemical transduction. But then when it comes to something like uh, uh, mate selection, uh, who should I get married to or not, probably my nose tells me about the immune compatibility between me and, and this other person in a way that I can't see, that I can't feel. So smell is useful there. Smell is useful if you think about if I presented you with a plate of beautiful fish. It looks fabulous. All the trimmings. 
but it just smells a bit, it, it's gone off, then your nose would dominate and you would not eat that thing no matter how beautiful it looked. So smell then becomes dominant for avoiding poisons, perhaps for make, mate so selection every, and taste true. Every taste. sense can warn you. Um, in some cases, yeah, warn you or, or provide different kind of window onto the world. Um, and so for, you know, when I want to know what shall I eat, what might poison me and what will be nutrify me, give me the calories and the, and the protein and the, and the minerals, then it's, taste is really the, the only true sense in picking up those qualities. And yet through evolution, we've learned that I can't put everything into my mouth and see what it tastes like, because that would be too time consuming. Better use my eyes to predict which trees have the ripe fruits, learn that, that fruits go from green and sour to red and ripe, and then I know by looking where I can get the best tasting uh, uh, food. So it's all the senses working together and realizing that each one is, is dominant and good, a different kind of thing. So is there, do we miss a sense? Do we miss a sense? Uh, I mean, there, have been, there has been talk of uh, uh, a magnetic sense. So maybe some, some, some birds, maybe some other creatures have this, can sort of navigate uh, towards north. No one knew quite how it turns out that they, that they have some kind of magnetic sense. And there's been a few suggestions in, the, in even very esteemed scientific journals that humans too, some humans have some vestige of a, of a, of a, um, a magnetic sense. So that's one that is kind of on the cusp where wouldn't it be nice if, if we could all have a really fully functioning magnetic sense. So I wouldn't need to read the map or, 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 or any of that stuff. I could just know how to get home. Leeds is, you know, that way, 200 miles. Um, that would be great. Would be great. So that would be one that we could say we miss. Uh, it is clearly there in other species. Uh, and, and some of my colleagues in Germany have been trying to train us to have an extra sense. So they might, they've been putting a belt on people in Germany. And uh, so work of Peter uh, Koenig and colleagues put a belt on people and it vibrates. And where it vibrates tells you where north is. And you, get, you, you wear this vibrating belt for you know, six weeks, two months, uh, with the hope being that after that time, you may have learnt almost to interpret that vibration as kind of a magnetic cue. Uh, we were talking about the missing sense. Mm -hmm. uh, are we missing a sense and uh, magnetism? That would be great. So if I can imagine that, I don't need a GPS anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible that we develop a sense like that? Um, I think you can you can educate the senses. I, th I suspect in the, in, the, in the belt case, it will always remain, will always feel like touch. Mm -hmm. It won't feel like a new sense, I guess. Uh, but certainly, we can educate the senses to be better. Um, and maybe most of the research is in the case of those who've lost a sense, those who are blind or deaf. Can they use some sort of sensory substitution system? To, 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 to use one of their remaining senses in order to make up for the loss of vision, say. And there are tactile visual vests that people can wear. There are glasses that um, have little sort of cameras on the side that may change what you see into what a, what a sighted person would see. They'll change it into sound. And the question of what sort of sound should you have? And, and do those blind people who hear the world as a sighted person see, do they really see? Or do you have to have these things in order to actually see? That gets to be a, a very philosophical question about what does it mean to see? But I suspect mostly it's about um, you can train the senses to do more stuff, better stuff, but it's probably impossible to, to create a new sense or to take one existing sense and kind of turn it into something else. I think it will always stay the thing it was. So, so when we uh, when we uh, conclude that our vision is do dominant, uh, and uh, there are reasons for that, um, uh, now we enter a new era. What 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 can we expect from the other senses? What will be the dominant or a, a more? What will be a sense that will be more um, uh, uh, will be of more influence or change in? In, the, in our future, mm -hmm. in our new time. Mm -hmm. So looking forward in terms of how we will be sensorially, multi-sensorially stimulated, um, I think kind of the answer to that question, it, may, it might be partly about desire and what people would like to happen uh, and how they'd like their senses to be stimulated. But it's as much a matter of technology 
how can you deliver sensations differently? And I think uh, over the last 10, 15 years, a lot of our research on touch, say for example, has been driven by the fact that now, you know, uh, tactile technology, tactile stimulation in mobile devices, in screens, in cars, where you name it, is now there. The technology exists, and maybe now there are three billion vibrating devices in people's pockets. That wasn't the case a decade ago. So suddenly the technology has allowed us to stimulate the skin in new ways. Like with a touchpad. Yep. All these things didn't exist 10, 15 years ago, and they're ubiquitous now. So that technology allows us to stimulate the sense of touch more, hopefully better. And the question is how, what benefits can we deliver? Is there something about mechanical, digital touch that is never the same as the real personal touch? Or can we simulate it all? And I suspect that, I mean, some of our research I suspect suggests, uh, and the stuff we read suggests that maybe you cannot simulate. So real touch, kind of the Midas touch, the gentle casual touch that will make you feel better, pick up somebody's change, return your library books on time, big, give a bigger tip, that kind of casual touch uh, is kind of an emotional use of the sense of touch. And you might say, could I deliver that Midas touch? Because it seems to make the world a better place by, by a tactile vest or having a set of vibrators, just do that. It turns out, nope, it doesn't work. There seems to be something special about real human to human touch. Can, um, can, can you explain what is the Midas touch? So the Midas touch is kind of the name that, uh, uh, was it Midas, King Midas, everything he touched turned to gold, was that there? Um, so it, the way it works in the hands of social psychologists is that if uh, you do a study and you just gently touch somebody on the shoulder, be it the waitress in the restaurant, be it the librarian at the library, um, be it the person on the street, then those who are gently touched, who have had the Midas touch in effect, uh, show more pro-social behaviour. So they will return their library books, they will pay their fines, they will give a bigger tip, uh, they will be more social beings just from this interpersonal touch. And because this, this kind of interpersonal touch is so beneficial, in some sense, those who are now developing the technology to vibrate our pockets, our hands, are wondering, could we deliver that through your touch screen, your, your, your iPad, your, your mobile device. Okay. And it turns out so far no one's been able to do that. And maybe there's just something about real touch that's missing. Maybe when, when you feel the touch of another person, it's got a certain speed. Maybe it's got a certain temperature. And I know if I look in your, in your hairy skin, I know exactly the speed that your skin likes to be touched. Maybe we're just not copying that. Who knows? Um, so it's a technology there, and this is, is you know, open up the world of touch, and is doing that already. Then, if you think about smell, where is it going to? Where is it going to? Um, so, uh, did, how, how will the future look like with with a better, better uh, developed touch? So now, now you you'd say, well, we, we we see the evidence. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, but in let's say in uh, 10, 15, 20 years, what what uh, how will it look like? Oh, okay. We might imagine that um, maybe every device will have will be touch enabled in some way. Everything from the cutlery that you hold when you go to the restaurant, to the car that you drive if we're still driving, to any phones, smartphones, tablets, computers. Maybe they'll, they'll all be touch enabled uh, through the chairs we sit on. You already have kind of the massage chair, so why not make that a, a ubiquitous feature of any? Uh, thing. There are chefs we work with who are, who are vibrating the table. So touch, I think, will be everywhere and it will be used to, for a variety of purposes, to transmit information. So you, you, you mean everything around us in our environment, our situation, will be touchable? Or, or, will, or will give us information? Or, 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 or we'll, we'll have some sort of org so maybe any digital device will have some that we interact with will have some sort of tactile functionality. Not just the feel of the thing itself, but it will be enabled to vibrate, to give us illusions of touch, to give us a perception of temperature or of wetness, for example. So working a lot with clothes companies and thinking about uh, the transition that most that people are increasingly doing their shopping online, and that's fine for books and CDs, but when it comes to clothing, well, somehow I, kind of, I want to feel what the fabric's gonna be like. I'm a bit less comfortable doing online purchasing there. So there's a lot of interest in how you can uh, enable 
kind of technology we have at home, our laptops and computers, is there some way we can trick the brain into giving you the feeling of real materials and by so doing kind of an, an increased sales of online sales of clothing and other stuff. So how do we virtually create touch and texture but any kind of uh, attribute? I know that if I, if I give you food to eat with heavier cutlery, then uh, it'll taste better to you, you'll be willing to pay more for it. And now somebody in, in Far East has created a, a digital fork that by some sort of vibration and stimulation, it will feel heavier to you. It's not literally heavy, it just tricks your brain by stimulating the sense of touch in a new way to give you the illusion of weight. That's something that ought to be built into everything, because we know already that if you see something like the you know, Bang & Olufsen remote so control... You, you can serve food which is less tastier? Less, un less, un less, less unhealthy, should we say. Less unhealthy, okay. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're, yeah, you're it's, quality. it's quality, yeah, it's quality. But yeah, absolutely, so we've done studies with um, uh, serving people yogurts in yogurt pots or bowls uh, and just drop a little weight in the bottom of the yogurt and people believe they're going to be fuller sooner because your brain cannot separate the weight in the hand from the weight of the thing that's in the package. Heavier cutlery helps and now there's technology to do that. So I'd imagine that any sort of a device will be thinking, how do I engage more senses? Because this is what the sensory marketers are saying, whatever product service you're delivering, engage more of your consumer senses. Yeah. And touch is an obvious one because it has been neglected for so long. And yet it's sort of our biggest sense, 18 to 20% of our body mass given over to the skin. And it can deliver some of these um, effective hedonic benefits, make us feel good if we just stimulate it right. Yeah, but uh, everything you say, right, so far, it's all uh, about uh, the benefit for, well, this is not all, but... I hear a lot of uh, arguments that uh, that, uh, that companies can benefit mm -hmm. from because we can influence uh, people uh, the, the, their uh, perception and mm -hmm. uh, but what will be the general um, benefit for mankind? Yeah. So I think something like uh, one could position that a lot of people are worried about their weight. If I can give you a simple trick to be satisfied with less food which involves you know, carrying a little lead weight around and putting it in whatever <laughs> hole you're going to eat. That's something we can all use. It's an enabler for all. Clearly, companies might use that for their own means and ends, but it's something we can all... You know, the insight itself it is uh, flexible in its usage. Um, it's not uh, a secret, you mean? Not a secret. And it is something that anybody can apply to their daily life. But no, it doesn't, doesn't require high no, technology. Nobody does, of course. Uh, some, Almost so, some are starting to. So you say now... This year, um, 2016, there will be five books published on the topic of bowl food. Bowl food? Eating food out of a bowl. Oh. Five cookbooks. A whole trend, a wave of interest. What's going on? It's just food in a bowl. I don't get it. But if you think about that, that's got a lot of sensory design in it. Because with a bowl, you're more likely to hold the bowl in your hands. If you hold the bowl, you feel the weight. If you feel the weight, you're satisfied with less. A lot of the bowl food movement is around trying to eat eat more healthy or eat less, in a way, con control, aware of your weight and controlling it. And so having a heavy bowl in the hand helps. That it's a warm bowl maybe makes the world seem better. Uh, and that you can smell contents more, tricks your brain in a different way. So I think there are trends that are out there already that people are engaged in, that you can reframe in terms of this sort of sensory, sensory design, but you didn't, just didn't realize. But if you do realize, you can measure it, then what could be done uh, through to I'm thinking a lot about, uh, I've just been on a, a tour in Saudi Arabia and Dubai with uh, paediatricians talking about infant touch. So what's it good for? Uh, my wife, she's not here uh, at the moment, uh, but she was premature by about three months. I think her mum fell off a chair and actually popped. And so she's about this big. <laughs> no, she comes up to about here. Uh, uh, and I think that's because as a premature infant in the 1960s, you were stuck in an incubator and left. You weren't touched. It turns out if you're a premature baby, if you're a difficult birth, if you're touched, if you're given this effective touch massage in those early months, you will develop a healthier uh, to normal weight with less illness as a result. So I believe passionately that sort of uh, early life touch is very important. And it's kind of being lost that um, a lot of parents will not touch or massage their, their offspring, uh, both normal weight and the kind of preterm ones. And yet from all the studies I see, it can have a profoundly beneficial effect both on bonding, both on quality of sleep, on, on, on um, sort of health and, uh, and disease prevention. It all comes just through stimulating the touch, maybe releasing some, some uh, aroma as well. And now I'm going around the world trying to tell the, the paediatricians this is important. 
and you should be you know, educating young mothers on the benefits of interpersonal touch because it's been neglected and yet it's in all of our hands literally to, to do something about it. How will it change the world? <sighs> because it will never be the same. It is always developing and, uh, uh, and uh, I assume you can consider it growth when we uh, develop our other senses more than we used to do. So maybe um, it's, a, this, it's a sort of a rebalancing of, of things. It's a rebalancing, but is it, is it, do we also get richer experiences? Precious. I'd say a more um, different kind of, a different balance of sensory experience. And in particular, I'd want to say um, kind of more connection with the emotional side of our being, of the world, that you know, smell, taste and touch, these are the emotional senses with much more direct links to sort of mood and emotion than our hearing and vision that have to go all the way to the back of the head and then come. So, so it, it puts us in touch with our emotional side. And I think that's a good thing that's been neglected. And I can point to you these many examples, you know, from the, from the infants to, the, to, to, to uh, old age pensioners, to those in hospital who, who, if you can engage the more emotional senses in a more intelligently designed manner, lead to benefits for wherever you look, from preterm infants to old people who are wrinkly and no one wants to touch them, through, you know, kids in hospital who are so petrified, if you give them a petting dog, like a dog in a hospital, that shouldn't be right. And yet that relaxation that will come through touch with another uh, animate object far outweighs the, the other things and does lead to improved uh, recovery. And I think across, the, across all the senses you can see how uh, being more aware of the impact of all of our senses, being more aware of the kind of the sensory imbalance that we've kind of got ourselves into, largely as a result of technology, uh, can lead to a, a better, more fulfilled uh, uh, world as a result. So, um, is it possible that in the future we will uh, well, give more value to uh, other senses or other experiences from senses? Uh -huh. Right now, for example, in a, in, a, in a court, we have an eyewitness. Is it possible to have a nose witness? So I think looking forward, um, I, would, I would hope there'd be sort of increased value put on the other senses, that's for sure. And yet I'm also kind of conscious in a way that almost no matter what I do, no matter what the research shows, nevertheless, there is this kind of recurrent bias or um, belief that, that will always bring us back to the visual in a way. So I see it, say, in uh, work in, in, in fashion stores and uh, in all sorts of situations where I can prove that adding the other senses makes the experience better. And yet I'm very aware that the consumer or the person at home or the company will attribute that improvement to vision. Just to imagine we've got the Euro football at the moment. I know if I, I can give you a, the technology exists to give you a little plug-in for the side of your TV that will release the smell of fresh cut grass. So you can see them playing on the screen, you've got the smell of fresh cut grass. If I asked you how immersed you were in the experience, how much you enjoyed the game of football, the ratings would go up, I believe, with, with, with the scent uh, enabled TV. And yet I, I think after watching the game, I could show you your results went up, you liked it more, but you'd say, no, I just, it was just a good game. I could see it and, uh, and it was really good football. So we'll always misattribute the causes of our experience to the wrong things. How, to, how, how are you going to, uh, to uh, explain to people? Um, it's a challenge, I think. And sort of, I guess from five or 10 years ago, I used to believe, well, if I can prove it, then the world will change. If I can show you the graph and say, okay, look, here's how much your people's experience went up, how much sales went up, you'd have to believe that. And you might say, well, is, did you do your experiment well? But once you believe me on that score, if it's significant, that's it. Time to change the way we're doing things. And yet, th through experience, I realise that's just not the way things happen often. There's a whole section of the world of people who you might want to influence, uh, who no, no, no amount of evidence or graphs or data will ever convince they'll still have their kind of intuitive beliefs and kind of go with that somehow. So simply by doing more experiments, by writing more papers, by showing more graphs will not do it. How else are you going to influence them? Um, and this is where I think for us, 
this idea of kind of experiential events, uh, often working with chefs or, or, or bringing people into environments where we can change the lighting, change the music, and demonstrate to them, um, that's much more powerful to many people. And that does lead people to go away and say, okay, I'm gonna do things differently wherever I am. Don't even show me the graph, I just know what I felt. And we've had people coming out, um, we did a 3,000 person wine tasting, where we changed the lighting, changed the music, and you just had this one glass of wine in your hand, a scorecard, and you say, how fruity, how much do you like the wine? And then you still got your scorecard, still got your glass of wine, and I changed the lighting, I changed the music, and I asked you to taste the wine again, and suddenly it tastes different. And then I changed the lighting again, and your wine tastes, I'm not doing water to wine, but I'm changing it, I'm making it more fruity, fresh, more liked, or less liked. So I'm, I'm recreating the Provencal Rosé moment in one environment in 10 minutes. Uh, and not everyone gets it, but those who do said, you know, it's unbelievable, I didn't think it was gonna work. And then as soon as you change the lighting, it changed the taste. It happens. And with that, with the power of your own experience, that's what will, will drive people to go out and say, okay, I'm gonna do it. But it took us a long time to realize that that's yeah. maybe a better way or, 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 or maybe the only way of, it, of influencing people about things that, that aren't necessarily intuitive to them or go against the kind of the visual dominance that, that is the, uh, the bedrock and that is built into our brains. So that, that this, this looks, it sounds like fun, going to a restaurant and then, and then uh, making that an experience which changes. Even if, if you keep on drinking the same wine, the, the, the taste of the wine changes during the evening. That's strange. And, I thought, all, and instantaneously for some people. But it's also fun. Yeah. Uh, but but, but uh, I would like to know where it really makes a difference in, um, um, in w where, how, um, maybe you understand what I, what, what I mean. Where, 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 Does where? anyone understand? <laughs> <laughs> how, where, uh, what? Uh. <laughs> How will it change the world, really, in a, in a, in a way that, uh, that uh, look, like, th now England is, is leaving the European Union. That will change the world. That will change a lot of things in, 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 uh, in Europe. People get scary uh, 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 of the idea of what will happen next. Scotland, independent, mm -hmm. maybe Ireland. Uh, uh, people don't know. Um, so that is a big influence. And I can, I can imagine, I trust on my eyesight. Uh, if that changes, that the world around us will, will change because, because our senses are reprogrammed or get reprogrammed without us knowing maybe, but they get reprogrammed. How, <clears throat> what will that do to the world if, we, uh, if other senses get a, get a bigger say in our reality? So one might say of the uh, maybe uh, I could <laughs> I could I reframe the question. Okay. But what will change to our reality if we use our other senses better? So what will change? Um, I think maybe you might say the uh, uh, Brexit vote, as they were describing on the television last night, was a once in a lifetime. Yeah. Political commentators in the seventies. I've never seen anything like this, and never will again. Um, nor will our children, so I think events of, the, of that magnitude are rare. Um, and I also think that the work that we do, it's more of a nudging, it's small, little, small change here, small change there. There are rarely fall off your seat moments of wow. Um, so it's more an, an, an accretion of lots of little small nudges, benefits, improvements, enhancements, that over time you say, okay, we've really got somewhere now. But at any one moment, there's not suddenly a, uh, an aha moment or a, a shock but moment. Over time, over over time? time, what will change? What, what, how, uh, when you compare uh, uh, the year 2000 with the, with the year 2050. So, uh, I uh, write a lot about the, uh, the um, foolishness of, of predicting what's going to happen a few years hence, because everyone who's ever done it's always got it wrong. So give me a wrong answer. Uh, that in 1885, 1894, we had people, eminent scientists, writing that a century hence, so in 1994, uh, people will be eating pills. They won't eat meals, that's ridiculous, inefficient. You'll have a pill that will come out of a slot in the wall, uh, you'll eat that and get on with your work. How much more productive would we be? That's never happened, it's never going to happen. 
Uh, you'll have people saying we're, we're going to be eating algal cuisine. Soylent green, that's not happening. Um, and he goes on and on, all the predictions about what the future will be like. Turn out not to be like that. Uh, so I, I sort of say, I, I've no idea where it's going. But if, if there's one person who can, give, who can give me any open door to the future, who can open any door to the future about this uh, field, it's you, of course. Because you, you, you know more about our senses than I do. And, and you, you must have a clue of what it will bring us. Uh, nope, I think it's a surprise for us all. Really? Yeah. Don't you and have a goal or an, or an idea for a world? It would be great if we, no, you think... we could accomplish that. No, not really. Uh, I think the world will go the way it goes. And, and you, you, you can uh, exert some influence over trends and fashions. Uh, but you can drive them or predict them, I think, not. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so it's yeah. almost like a, you know, you're just a, a very faint influence on, on forces that are much greater uh, than yourself in society at large, uh, in technology, um, and to the extent that it's foolish to even, even trying to predict. We all have this kind of overconfidence bias and gives you a sort of sense of certainty that really isn't there. Is it possible to think of this, uh, this uh, referendum for uh, leaving uh, the e uh, EU or staying within the EU, that if other senses were dominant, that, the, <laughs> that it would have another outcome? Well, to the extent that we are primarily audiovisual creatures um, and that those senses are the more rational ones, uh, that any rebalancing of our other senses, any ramping up of smell, of taste, of touch, these are the more emotional senses. So you might imagine that would lead to more emotional decision making. Uh, and you could take from that what you will, whether that would have meant we'd have left sooner <laughs> or later. Uh, who knows, yeah. one or the other, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, what, is, what is the point you would like to express or point out uh, regarding your research uh, uh, on senses, uh, which is... Um, um, I don't want to miss anything regarding your research. What is what is for you the most important thing regarding the the, the census? What is what, what is your your main quest or your main goal in 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 the studying them? I guess that the the main goal for myself and for the lab I run here at Oxford is to try and uh, understand and take the understanding of how the senses interact, um, the sometimes unpredictable ways our senses combine information and use those rules uh, in the design of a, a different and hopefully better world. And that those kind of insights about the science of the senses, about multi-sensory perception, I think span everywhere from the design of warning signals for car drivers through uh, the design of food and beverage experiences that are more stimulating or healthier or more memorable. Uh, people have different goals or objectives through to kind of the environments in which we, 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 we live and work um, we've done lots of work on kind of the you know, uh, ambient fragrance and paint colours and lighting and, 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 and nature and how those things might make us uh, healthier, happier, more productive um, through uh, all sorts of, I mean, sort of health care is an area that hasn't as yet received as much research around sensory design, multi-sensory design. Can, and can yet, you sum up a, a few things which, would, which could be better uh, generally for, for, for people? feeling better or having the idea they're living in a better world? Do you mean safety and you mean health yep. issues? Can you sum up a few of them? Um, so something like uh, bringing hospitality back to hospitals. That would be one thing that I think is a, 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 a lead to a better world. And that will we'll get there through engaging the senses uh, in a more intelligent design of hospital health care uh, type situations. I think um, in the delivery of sort of healthier foods that taste the same as they always did to us, that's important to many people, and yet have less of the unhealthy ingredients through, through, through intelligent design of the multisensory experience, through everything we know about how the mind processes flavour, that's going to be uh, huge. Uh, through um, sort of, I guess, sort of transport and technology, uh, I see a lot of benefits for... 
driver safety, for air traffic control, for even financial trading situations where every kind of millisecond counts in can terms of life safety. <laughs> can you explain that in the, in the car for safety? Yep. What, so, so what, actually, how? how? Um, so uh, at the present time, uh, drivers are being confronted with more and more information, uh, mobile phones, internet in their cars, uh, head-up displays that are telling you about every single hotel and bar and restaurant uh, competing with what's meant to be going on outside the window screen. So there's a lot more distractions in cars than ever before, enabled through technology. A lot of those distractions are now being delivered by the content providers, not the car companies. So kind of we've had the technology for years, but the car companies would never release it for fear of accident. But now it's the mobile providers for the first time can actually provide this content for drivers and they don't care about safety, not in the same way as the car companies do. And what that means then is suddenly we have a generation of drivers who are more distracted, who are more texting, one of the most dangerous things you could possibly do. Um, and I tell my undergraduates, uh, you know, for the females in the audience, the most likely way they're going to die is at the uh, hands of their wheel when their boyfriend's driving. By far, kind of the biggest uh, cause of death. Uh, and it is through this texting and distraction at the wheel. Um, and so anything we can do there could have a profound influence. And I see from our research that we can deliver, we can get drivers to, to, to turn their heads back to the road if they're distracted, to brake more rapidly if a potential collision event is occurring, through not just by having a red throbbing light that the engineer designs, but by putting sounds behind your head. So it turns out that your brain has special dedicated circuits just for this bit of space behind your head. The engineer never thought of putting a warning signal there, but if I, I know from the, understanding how the brain works, some of how the brain works, that there's a special bit of the brain that only cares about this bit of space, that isn't used while driving. And if I put something in your headrest, it can make you turn your head that much faster than anything else. What can you put in the headrest? Uh, some sort of loudspeaker. So if a sound comes from, a sound comes from just behind your head, your brain treats it differently, processes it differently, than if exactly the same sound comes from in front, or from the dashboard, or from the door panel. Same sound, same loudspeaker, but just behind your head. Yeah. It's processed differently. No one thought of that. No engineer in any of the car companies thought of that. But it's it falls cool. out of the brain design, sort of understanding the, the senses and how they process information. It's one of those unexpected things that comes out. And yet it, we've demonstrated in the lab, but also in the driving simulator, that you can uh, reduce uh, reaction times amongst drivers to an extent that should lead to significant reductions in, in, uh, in accidents on our roads. Can you, for example, I just think of it, when people uh, uh, drive drunk, that you get sensors in the car which uh, the, who, who measure uh, al alcohol. Yep, so you're going to breathe in the thing before you... That's actually your ignition, uh, kind if of. You, if you don't do that, that the car will recognize it. Um, I or would believe so. Can, yeah, I believe, I believe so. Um, you can build a small hammer into, into his head. <laughs> <laughs> headrest. <laughs> Uh, no, so I mean, you can detect if people are sleepy, so probably, I don't know the exact figures, but it might turn out that sleepy di drivers are more dangerous as a group than drunk drivers. And maybe a third of all accidents are in some way related to sleepiness, falling asleep at the wheel, tiredness. Uh, and so if that is, in fact, a bigger cause of death on our roads, I know already that the car companies can detect signs of falling asleep. Your car might ask you a question, and then depending on, on, on how you verbalize your response, it can tell from the gaps, it can measure your blinking, it can measure how, how tightly you're, you're squeezing the steering wheel, it can measure how uh, aggressively you're braking, and from all of those cues can get a pretty good estimate uh, of, of your sleepiness. Um, so I imagine the same is true for, uh, for, for uh, alcohol uh, oh. level. Okay, and so it, it, and, and do car companies uh, uh, are, are they researching this? The sleepiness one, definitely. Um, Can you re rephrase that? Uh, so the uh, I know that the car companies uh, have been working on the technologies to uh, predict the uh, sleepiness of drivers, uh, and then take countermeasures. Uh, which probably, if, if your car switches itself off if it thinks you're tired, no one's going to buy that car. Uh, but if it, but if it automatically uh, lowers the windows or releases an alerting scent. That's not quite such an aggressive move. Ideally, you should stop, but maybe that's kind of an intermediate. And I know car companies are thinking in that space and have the technology to work. In terms of the uh, drinking while driving, I haven't heard actually of anything 
uh, in that space. And, and you, were, you were given an example of the financial markets. Mm -hmm. So you think, maybe, maybe you think, well, I guess it's a strange jump from, from, from car drivers to financial <laughs> markets. But to us, in a way, they're, they're the same in that this research on the design of warning signals uh, is an area where every millisecond, every thousandth of a second matters. There aren't many other situations in life I mean, where I say, I can save you uh, a hundredth of a second. You say, well, so what? Who cares? What's that going to do to life? Driving and financial markets are probably two of the few areas where such tiny improvements in performance can lead to huge financial consequences, be it in health care provision for, 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 and death at the wheel, or be it in profits made in turbulent financial markets like we've had for the last day or two. Um, so I think it's something like the figures from Information Week, one of the magazines, for every millisecond advantage a typical sized trading house gets in the speed at which information comes in, that's worth $100 million a year to that company. So you, you already see that the, um, a lot of these companies will put their offices as close to where the cables come out from under the uh, kind of North Atlantic to get that little millisecond advantage as compared to their competitors who are in the city. So they're physically doing things to maximize, to speed up, but they've never, as far as I can tell, ever thought about the design of their interface, the screens, the alerts that they get, saying, you know, Brexit has just happened, you need some sort of special sound for that, maybe, <laughs> though that would give you a, a few milliseconds advantage. And, and if, you're, if you're an economist, then you can, you can say, well, to the global economy, what would the benefit of one millisecond faster braking be in terms of accidents? And model that, and you can say to the financial markets, what would the benefit of one millisecond be to the amount of money made by companies? Um, and then you can actually equate, say, maybe they're worth as much, or maybe the financial markets, that's a, a bigger potential market for, for milliseconds mattering and, and, and having a bigger financial uh, end result. So it's, that's a lot of our work is, is taking domains that are very different. But you say you can apply the insights here, and there's 30 years of research on warning signals for car drivers. And as far as I can tell, there's nothing on trading, warning traders. Nothing. Hmm. And it's like... That's so obvious. There's so much so knowledge here, yeah. and to us, it's the same thing. Yeah. But we have it in different, yeah. in different sort of bins, and that's a lot of our research is just sort of taking insights from one area and saying, "Hey, can we apply them over there?" Because we're not tied to any particular industry or, or product or category. Um, and in fact, there's lots of knowledge that just is sort of siloed. And 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 what about um, um, pain relief? What 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 uh, if you? Suppose you're, you are able to relieve people from pain by using your senses in mm -hmm. a different way. Then, no, you, no. then people would be very happy with yep. it. So I think there's no suppose about it. It's a fact. You can uh, help reduce, modulate pain through the senses. Um, and there are a number of ways of doing it uh, that have been and, proven and to did, be effective. Did, did you think about it? Uh, uh, is it the result of your research? Uh, so what, what's what's your what's your part in it? What's our part? Uh, so, why, so we've done a, a very small part of, of the research, looking at how we can take the insights uh, about how the sensory interaction from one domain to another. So, uh, for example, from everything we've learned about sensory dominance in food, how can we apply that to sensory dominance in pain relief? So, if like from pleasure to pain, because they're just twins of the same continuum, maybe. Uh, and what we've been doing is, for example. Uh, we know that you perceive things more intensely if you concentrate on them. And if you're distracted, you don't notice them as much. So a lot of pain relief strategies, say for bandage uh, changes, uh, a very painful procedure, what can you do to distract people? If you can take their attention away somewhere else, it will hurt less. Uh, so we've done work um, on attentional manipulation, saying maybe uh, if you watch a, uh, a very engaging video, Visual distraction, pain hurts less. That's a fact, and that's going to be incorporated in some uh, areas. What we've also been looking at is um, patients here in Oxford, uh, working with an Australian colleague, been looking at a special group of chronic regional pain syndrome, CRPS patients. And these are rare, fortunately, but uh, very severe cases of very often people who've been on the motorbike, uh, they got thrown off in a car in an accident, uh, broke something, it seems to have recovered. And then six months later, suddenly they get this excruciating pain. 
that will not go away, that medication has no impact on, that surgery seems to have no impact on, but you're left with lifelong chronic pain in a limb. Uh, so we've been doing work with these patients who are very hard to work with because they're in such pain, they don't want to, taking part in one of your experiments is the last thing yeah. <laughs> kind of they think they want to do. Uh, but those who have been able to work with, uh, we've been able to show that if I can make your hand look smaller, if I can use visual dominance, so we had patients looking at their their their, um, their affected limb through a pair of like binoculars that have been turned backwards, so it makes everything look smaller. And if you look at your limb, and it looks smaller to you. It hurts less. Really? Yeah. And it also reduces swelling. So this psychological trip of just using visual dominance of the eyes has both a psychological impact on reduced pain, but also a physiological impact on reduced swelling uh, in in the limb. How long this lasts, I can't say. I can demonstrate it, we can do it in an hour for 20 or 50 or 100 of these patients. If you kept looking at your limb and it was very small for a week, a month, a year, who knows how long the effects will last. Will they wear off? It's possible, we don't know. But that's a kind of very difficult, uh, very long term. But at least in the short term, you can deliver pain relief through these sort of tricks of the mind. So similarly, I've got my colleagues who are thinking about uh, fragrance. I know that um, for babies, uh, when they have sometimes what's called a heel prick procedure, very painful. Uh, so what do, you, what do nurses do? They give the baby a, a sugar cube. So a sweet taste reduces pain. It's again a cross-modal effect. Uh, my colleagues in Australia um, have been working in adults to see whether a sweet smell can do the same thing. So if I ask you, is strawberry, is caramel, is vanilla, are they sweet? You say, yes, they smell sweet. They can't literally smell sweet. Sweet's a taste and smells a smell, and yet they do kind of smell sweet. And if you diffuse that aroma while people are in pain, they will rate the pain lower and they'll be able to resist for longer. And again, it's using the senses, using uh, uh, sight in one case, using smell in another. And I'm equally convinced in um, the effect of sound. Uh, you know, you go to the dentist, it's I'm sure if I could take that sound out, it would be a wholly different experience if I could quieten it, if I could play the sound of chirping birds, something else. It just would hurt less. Um, yeah. So yeah. All, all the senses play a role. Um, so what, what are the things that you see around you which you think, well, that must be solvable or, or that must be, I, 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 I must be able to, give, to make that a better experience? Which you didn't solve yet, but but and you you know it, you it is solvable, yep. but you didn't succeed so yep. far. There okay. might be some things. So I, I, I guess I'm just sort of. I mean, there are there are lots of questions that someone like myself just can't answer. So lots of unsolvable things that uh, I, I'm, I'm not the right kind of specialist for. Uh, of those for which I think we have insights that could be useful then almost any situation of daily life, I think there's a potential benefits of better sensory design. And that is, you know, from hospitals to healthcare, to offices, to the home, to the workplace, to the aeroplane, uh, to the car, to transport, wherever you look, uh, I think engaging the senses, all of the senses better would lead to more immersive, more engaging, healthier, more enjoyable, more memorable experiences. So which are the ones that we haven't got to yet? Those tend to be the ones where it's, it's either gonna be harder to do, harder to get to, or harder to convince those in, in, in authority that this is something they might think about. Um, so of those, uh, hospitals is one that I think is a huge potential market. And lots of the insights that we take from designing supermarkets and stores to be better. A lot of those insights that you can apply to the healthcare situation. Um, we haven't got there yet because a lot of our grant applications have been turned down. Uh, finally, we've got a, 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 a Spanish hospital just outside Barcelona, that uh, treat a private hospital that treats uh, children with cancer, and they've got a very open-minded approach to engaging with the senses, and they're doing some brilliant things. And we've been able to start working with them since this year, together with a culinary centre to design a sensory design, multi-sensory design of, of healthcare for some very sick children. And there are lots of things I think we can apply there. So I'm thinking in five or ten years that will come to be much more uh, relevant. Uh, aeroplanes is another one. I sort of mentioned the sort of the uh, sound bite, this music that would enhance the taste of the food. But again, I think there's a lot more that can be done there. 
it's just hard to get access to do the experiments on the aeroplanes. Um, but I see some of the some of the big airlines. You kind of know they want to innovate to differentiate themselves, at least at the top end in the first and business class. And yet you think how many more celebrity chefs can they get? Don't they sort of realize that celebrity chef doesn't make the food taste better. That's not the way to go. So you've got you've got the the intention, but not the execution. And I think engaging all the senses and thinking about the whole experience and the Provencal rose and how do you put that into the aeroplane might offer the potential to, to, to radically innovate in that space too. There's the money, there's the interest, but how do you get there? Um, and uh, the trading floor is another one that's uh, has its own peculiar difficulties in that the uh, financial traders are masters of the universe. They think they're God. Um, and that every every hour of their time is worth however many million euros or pounds or whatever it is. So I, I want to test them. I want them to take part in the experiment so I can demonstrate to them the benefit of using this or that. But they're too important to, to give up their time to take part in research. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another one. The first only reason is it's going to be impossible to get to. Yeah. Uh, there are maybe there are, there are ways around it, um, but I mean, so there are, there are lots of kind of challenging domains because of the uh, yeah who's in control of them or because of the uh, practical limitations. Um, but hopefully we'll get there somehow. Yeah. So the challenge really for us is to say how do we, how do we influence the, the, those who are in control to, to really take that step? Is it also possible? So uh, since since evolution, we uh, we uh, um, developed our senses, and some more equal than others, uh, more important than others. Uh, so if we if we develop uh, in this direction, what will happen to the to the Weaker senses. So I guess there, there is a potential that if we don't use, we don't use it, you lose it. It's kind of the, uh, the phrase that gets banded around a lot. And one might think of something like our pheromonal sense, this kind of a inter conspecific chemical communication that we know dogs have and other animals have, but humans seem to more or less have lost. It's like we didn't need it. And maybe the sort of suggestion is that when we went from four legs, and our nose was very close to the ground, and smell was very important. Uh, and then we went up onto two legs, suddenly we're much further away from the smelly stuff, and hence that's partly when our sense of smell started its decline. And that now if we compare ourselves to dogs, then clearly dogs are much better able to navigate and to tell apart things through smell, whereas our sense of smell, we can see in the evolutionary record that it was very important, because more of our genetic material is given over to smell than to any other sense. And yet today, look at URI and our, and our, and our nasal apparatus is, is sadly diminished from what it once was in the past. So we're losing it, you could say. Is that a problem? Is that a problem? It feels a bit like sort of ex extinction of the species, isn't it? Is it a problem that little furry rat somewhere in, I don't know, <laughs> off, five hours off New Zealand just got extinguished? Uh, it feels like it ought to be a problem there. I can't say I feel much, much. Um, if we lost our senses? I mean, that is a question you can ask people. Uh, if, you, if, I, if I had to take one of your senses away, which one would you least like to lose? And everyone goes, oh, of course, my, my eyes. Uh, but in fact, if you look at suicides after the loss of a sense, then people are far more likely to commit suicide after the loss of smell than vision. Because this is the one that gives you your emotional life, your connection, uh, your enjoyment of food, linked to sort of attraction. And so it turns out this is the one that actually leads to, uh, you should avoid the loss of. Um, and that maybe those who are blinded still have, their, still have the memories of the images they can create for a number of years after. Uh, taste, it turns out, is probably the least important one. You could get rid of that and maybe you would not realize. And there have been a few scientists in history who've lost their tongues to um, syphilis. And the uh, French army were quite fond of chopping out Algerian tongues in the Napoleonic Wars or whenever it was. Um, and in both cases, it seems nothing much changes. So actually taste, your tongue might be very not important at all. Uh, nowadays, if uh, are we in danger of losing them? I guess it'll be a very slow decline. Um, and I think we really probably, we still do use all of our senses some of the time. So it's not that we never use smell. If I give you that rank, awful smelling fish, you'll use it then. Uh, you will use it for detecting fire. So I think they, they all are still used, in, and what we're trying to do is just increase the amount of time 
uh, that people are in, connect, in touch with or thinking about or mindful of uh, uh, their other senses. But what happens if we lose it? What happens if we lose? Um, well, it depends which one we lose. Because but you started with this pheromones. Pheromones. So what if we lose that? Maybe we have lost it. Yeah, but depends which side of the pheromones you are. Yeah, but if we lose that, then what happens? Then we lose that. 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 Uh, I guess people, by the very fact that you say which sense would you least like to lose and nobody really says smell, implies that we don't really value it as much as perhaps we should. Um, loss of the sense of touch is pretty pretty uh, debilitating. So I think it's going to be depend which... But can which, you which, say that if, if you lose this, uh, this uh, ability to, uh, um, like a dog, to smell or the, the, yeah. this pher pheromone uh, thing, uh, don't we need that for uh, reproduction? Apparently not. I think we get on okay. <laughs> don't we? I don't know. Um, so, uh, okay. so you know, maybe what happens is maybe we, we evolve with different individual senses telling us about different parts of the world or different stuff we need to know about poisons and pleasures, food and, and mates. Uh, and then th our brain, with all this information, starts to combine the senses, and so we have multi-sensory perception, and then that allows you to almost sort of predict or do things differently uh, in a way. So I guess we humans are quite rare in not only tasting food but also smelling it as, as when we swallow air is pushed out of the back of our nose. So it's almost like we have a pretty unique way of tasting food. It involves a nose um, as well as a mouth, and not many other species, not all other species have that. So we've kind of we've sort of adapted or learnt new ways of doing things through combining the senses in different ways, or using a sense that was developed for one thing for uh, something else. And that maybe now, without, um, if I look at the uh, the animal kingdom, then maybe mate selection is is mostly about smell and pheromones. It doesn't really matter, you know, how how, how shiny the hair or um, on the dog or something, it's or, or it's it's all about smell. Uh, in humans, it seems otherwise. It seems to be primarily about the visual. Um, so maybe yeah, we change our dominance. Now we're visually driven creatures. Maybe men more more than women. Uh, so we've done, we're doing things a different way. Maybe we we'll lose something that maybe you know uh, I'm not as able by visually inspecting a potential mate to figure out whether they'll make a good sort of genetic match in terms of our immune response of the offspring. Smell would, would, would tell me that much more directly. So if I lose smell, I can still make, pick a mate and reproduction will still take place, but maybe there'll be some errors or, or, or problems that will, will ensue. But if, if we use smell, we can pick a better partner? Yeah. You're sure? Yep. Why don't, research. We, why don't we? Because we're sort of visually dominant, so we've got this, it's almost this th thing again of we, we uh, so misattribute or uh, we, we sort of develop this bigger visual brain to help us to find the fruit in the trees, and then when it's half of our brain is given over to vision, it's hard not to use it for these other things. So and if, it, if we go out dating, yep. it, it's better to do that blindfolded? So that's the thing. Uh, it, I think it would be better to use all your senses. The more senses you have, the more information you've got, uh, and each sense will tell you about slightly different stuff. And yet we have uh, been working with artists uh, like Clara City, who have been doing, we've been sort of playing in this space, thinking about uh, the smell dating agency. So she and others are famous for kind of getting 100 people to wear a t-shirt, don't wash for a day or two, then bring in your t-shirt. And then the, 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 the speed date is you just smell all the t-shirts from one to 100. <laughs> and say, oh, I'd like a date with that one and that one and that one. And then you get to meet <laughs> the one, and sometimes it's somebody of a, of a sex that you're not, <laughs> you smell like a woman, but it's actually a man or vice versa. You get a bit of a shock. Uh, and other times, you know, they smell great, but they look awful. So what are you gonna do? I guess you'll end up reverting to your eyes. Uh, and yet, I sort of wonder if you were given both, not just the kind of the uh, online visual profile, but then also the smell. With those two cues, maybe you'd come to a better choice. And it, and it is kind of- But it works. 
What works? Well, this works. This this t-shirt sniffing. Well, you uh, you you three will smell. Gentlemen will smell different. Uh, your t-shirts will smell different, and they'll be more attractive to some people than others. So certainly there is information there. We don't all smell the same, uh, and some people will have attraction to one. Does it work? What would be the long-term consequences if we had, um, you know, did the experiment? And we had a hundred people. You can only pick your mate from a picture, and another hundred you can only pick from smell. Who would which, in which group would the divorce rates be higher? That's kind of the experiment that uh, probably I won't get the ethics to do, but uh, <laughs> would give you the answer you want. What do you and think? I, I'm not sure actually. Um, I, 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 go, I, def I definitely think that if you had the smell and the vision, you do better than just the vision. Uh, if you had one or the other. I was curious, I don't know. Well, the next experiment. Well, I mean, I can't, these days we have ethics, you see, and then no one will let me... Uh, if it's an artistic ex ex experience, art project, you can do it. But if you're a measurement scientist, then you've got to do the ethics, and then people start wondering about the ethics of, of that sort of... But it is interesting, and it is sort of open, and it's more... Um, Makes you think differently, and, uh, and maybe there are some differences between males and females. Um, so, so how about um, uh, feelings uh, using your senses? Is it possible to, when you reprogram your senses or use your senses in a different way, uh, that you experience other feelings like love or guilt or jealousy or anger? Uh, whether, I don't know whether you, whether you want to put feelings and emotions that they are not exclusively tied to a particular sense. So I was thinking I could show you a, a range of, 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 of faces and you'd say that one looks happy, that one looks sad, that one looks guilty, that one looks depressed. I could I could play you some the sounds of people's voices, you could do the same thing. I could even um, say put your hand out and I can probably tap and stroke and you'll be able to, you'll be able to decode the emotion through touch. Um, and even through smell, you can, some degree, I can smell happy from fearful. So th there's uh, some things that are associated with each sense. Is it possible, is it possible when you, uh, uh, well, you, you have an army, you want to fight the other army, that you, uh, that you use uh, temperature or smell or anything else to um, build up a, a feeling of hate, for example. Is that possible? Um, does, it, 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 does, it, does it smell different here in Britain uh, that they don't want to be part of you? <laughs> well, today, better. Um, so it's certainly true that the ambient scent uh, can change our mood. It can make us more relaxed, more aggressive. Uh, it can make us more alert or more relaxed. So you might say, I want my fighting force to be... Um, uh, sort of uh, alert and not relaxed. So maybe you're thinking a certain kind of uh, citrus or peppermint is going to be better than lavender or chamomile. Um, and beyond that... Um, For example, if a police uh, uh, hears a an, um, suspect and they, they use a different kind of uh, smell when they interrogate him, is it possible that he, he, he will confess earlier? Uh, certainly possible. So we say um, maybe, uh, so there are studies out there um, uh, that uh, you can change the scent in the slot machines in Las Vegas and there are certain scents that will make people spend more. Get money to people's ears. They won't tell you what the scent is exactly, but they say it works a special scent. Um, and if you believe that, then probably there are all sorts of outcomes you could get. There are, there are scents that will in increase the likelihood of a negotiation coming to a successful conclusion. There are scents that could be worked on the trader trading floor to um, say so you can sort of frame it as: Is there a scent that will get people to spend more? Is there a scent that will get people to be more aggressive? Is there a scent that will make people fight better or or confess sooner? And you might get, I think you could get any of those outcomes through scent, but really kind of the mechanism is, well, if you're more relaxed, I guess you're more, I'll tell you all sorts of stuff, whereas if I'm uptight and tense, I won't. And the mechanism that smell 
makes you confess sooner is by making you relax, perhaps. Uh, the, the reason why scent makes you spend more is not it directly makes you spend more, maybe makes you more comfortable or makes time pass slower. Maybe when you relax, time passes more slowly. Um, and there's certainly, certainly sense that um, for uh, there's some stuff on sort of negotiations, so conflict resolution, what sort of space should the uh, fighting parties be in? Does the paint colour matter? Yes. Does the lighting matter? Yes. Does the chair you're sitting on matter? Yes. Are there certain fragrances that might work better than others? Uh, very undoubtedly. Um, so what you're saying is the senses will make a difference if you use them right or wrong. Uh, 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 did you get a phone call from uh, the, the army? Or the yeah, yeah. Um, mostly from the US military. They call you? Uh, it's very strange. They, you get an email from Colonel so-and-so. Uh, please send me some stuff of this, or can you give a Skype conference to our, um, you do that, and then uh, the next week you say, oh, I, for I forgot to tell him something, there's this other paper I'm going to send him on air traffic control, by which time the email account's gone blank, doesn't exist, never existed. <laughs> We've had that two or three times, so they do get in touch. I don't know if it's their real name or not, and we do pass on some of the information. Uh, I think it is useful, uh, be it in, uh, uh, so there's a lot of interest at the moment in sort of surveillance, if I'm trying to detect a potential terrorist threat or aggressive incident, well, I've got my cameras and we've got more CCTV than anybody else. But if I also had a microphone and I could have like a two sense sensor, would that give me more information? And if so, what, how would I combine the sound from the microphone with a with a scanning image? So there is interest there in trying to sort of build what we've evolved uh, sort of naturally this multi sensory perception. Can you build it in, engineer it into robots and surveillance systems and other uh, other types of uh, uh, equipment and stuff, through to uh, work on alerting people. If you know, if I can make a car driver uh, hit the brakes half a second faster, I imagine I can make a soldier shoot <laughs> somebody uh, almost as with a much better as well. Through uh, long term, kind of for 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 for, for long term performance, there's things in the field of. I want to tell my operative what to do, but if I say, you know, hey, Hank, <laughs> shoot left, then the opposition will hear. So maybe if I have a vibrating suit, I can I can communicate without sound, without vision, so that other senses are left open. That's of interest. And we've been working on vibrating body devices through for those who are doing like very long term uh, missions. Uh, say if you're on a uh, one of those intercontinental refueling or long distance bombing routes. Uh, how do you keep your pilot awake for long enough? And they used to do sort of pills and stuff, but now there's work that if I if I capture the blue light of dawn, that kind of tricks your brain into thinking it's dawn. Oh, time to wake up. And and, and Swedish truck drivers through uh, military pilots can be kept more alert for longer. Through almost sort of playing with the senses in that way, so a lot of potential. Um, and and I guess we've done bits and pieces with the uh, TNO, the Dutch. Kind of military research, partly military research well, establishment. Well, it's from the government, but uh, yeah. it's also part, for part it's yeah. military. Yeah. And you sort of see, I see examples where um, for simulations yeah. uh, is it, important, whether it's, whether it's for soldiers simulating what it's going to be like when they're fighting somewhere new, or if it's for the uh, doctors simulating what it's going to be like operating in a military hospital in a war zone at 40 degrees in a tent with dust in your eye, uh, then just showing people the virtual reality doesn't do it. Where does it meet the, our re, uh, our real experience with the virtual reality? Uh, I guess you call it maybe it's augmented reality. So it's something that's a, a, a blend of both. Well, at what, what at what moment cannot can't we? Uh, is it impossible for us to um, to distinguish make the difference between the two realities? Um, I mean, one answer might be to say, well, it's all sort of virtual, it's all constructed without any of the technologies, what's coming, the information that's coming from your eyes and your ears and your nose. There's no direct readout of what's out there in the world. It's always kind of hypothesis generation, your, your brain predicting, imagining what the world is like, and then occasionally testing reality against your model. So in a way, we're always living in a virtual, uh, what doesn't feel like that way, but that's kind of how the brain sense it. It's everybody else's reality, you mean? 
I mean, it's obviously to some degree grounded in physical stuff, but... Uh, or related to a physical memory. Um, in part, that, that will, will sort of learn how the world is through prior exposure and, uh, and pick up kind of the regularities of the world and then use those to predict yeah. how, the, how the world's going to be like in a few moments' time uh, when we check. Um, and, and that just sort of... So a, on the one hand, the question, what, well, is it... Isn't all our perception kind of virtual, or is it all an illusion? Um, through to how will technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, will that become the new norm and replace? Who needs real nature when I can stick you in a, with a headset and play the sounds of nature and the smells of nature? Aren't you, is, is that as good as the real thing? Um, well, do you think 